uh, with the people at the uh, TM Center. Uh, and that's really, I, I know from my personal experience that uh, there probably aren't very many symptom uh, problems for people with transverse myelitis that are as significant to all of you and interfere with quality of life is the problems that you have with uh, bladder issues. And the reason I am so thrilled to have Dr. Wright here this morning is that not all urologists are really tied into neurogenic problems of the bladder. Uh, and that is really the, the specialization that Dr. Wright brings to us this morning. So I'm very appreciative that he's here. Well, I want to echo as well that it's great to be here. It's nice to see a bunch of familiar faces. And uh, I hope what I have to say will uh, help and uh, flesh out some of the ideas. Part of the goal of the talk this morning is uh, not to get too much into the nitty gritty of each of the areas, but basically to kind of paint the, the horizon or the full spectrum of A, what kinds of problems are or, or can result from TM, MS, neuropathic conditions and so on. And then what are the, the available options? You know, what, what is the range of things that can be done to basically at the end of the day, and, and we'll see this uh, hopefully as a theme, to accomplish three things. One is to be sure that <coughs> in issues of voiding dysfunction, that we're preserving the kidneys. You know, job one is to make sure that somewhere in the background there isn't some silent problem uh, with renal function that's going to come back to give us additional trouble, because you only get two of those. Um, in most, sometimes only one, but mostly two. And, uh, and then secondly, to make sure that one has adequate continence or control of elimination functions. And I'll be pr primarily highlighting bladder function in terms of uh, urinary uh, function and voiding, but I'll also touch on bowel function, which again, for many in the audience know that, you know, sometimes that's the worse or the, or the more difficult problem to manage. Um, <coughs> and so renal preservation, adequate continence and control, and then third is to maximize one's independence in managing those things. And I think with, you know, uh, understanding the horizon, there's often or most, most commonly a way to maximize those things or to really get those things uh, accomplished. But it takes some creativity and uh, a bit of understanding and patience to try and work through some of those experiments with a little bit of vigilance along the way. So hopefully that will make sense. Uh, <coughs> And we'll just, uh, the things I also want to talk, uh, touch on, the talking points, we're going to briefly review the physiology of voiding, just some background about how really complex the system is, what we kind of prior to these events take for granted, and then following these events think, wow, how could it be so awry or amiss? Um, <coughs> we're going to talk about the impact of TM or, again, neurodegenerative or neural injury on voiding function. And we're going to talk about strategies for evaluation and treatment planning some therapy options, and we'll kind of just run through those, some concluding statements, and hopefully at the end, if I'm not too long-winded, uh, there'll be enough time for questions, and, and I hope that uh, those will be generated. <coughs> so in talking about normal voiding function, one of the unique things, and the other thing is that this really encompasses pelvic function, which really involves three major functions, three major processes, in terms of the lower urinary tract and voiding, the bowel function in terms of uh, managing the, the GI tract, and then also sexual function. I'm not going to speak specifically. I know there's another talk later in the day or tomorrow at some point on the specific sexual function issues. If there are questions um, that come up at the end, I'd be happy to try and answer those, but um, we'll save that for another time. <coughs> but there is this unique process in the pelvis that really is not enjoyed by any other system to the same degree in the body. And that is this kind of autonomic and somatic control, this balance between fully reflex-driven processes and yet lots and lots of conscious cortical control. And without the, 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 those two systems functioning properly, this system really derails. And in the lower bowel and the bladder, there's two things that, you know, in a simplistic way, the, the bladder stores and it empties, and as if it were only that simple. Um, <laughs> there's a, a distension and a capacitance role for, for this process, and both of those are active neuro, neurologic processes. 
The bladder doesn't simply sit by passively and fill with urine. It actually has to have neural input in order to do that properly. The relaxation phase is neurally driven, as is the emptying phase. So there's, again, two places where this can kind of derail. These functions are both reflexive and conscious, as I described, <laughs> and we develop through our childhood learned behaviors to coordinate this voiding cycle in response to various stimuli. We come into the world with very little control of that, night or day, social situations, it doesn't matter. The bladder fills and it spontaneously empties in a coordinated fashion. As we age, <coughs> if there are other insults, even in folks who don't have neuropathic diseases or, or insults, that system can disconnect. And so <coughs> one, of the, one of the processes or goals is to try and repatch those or re reconnect those going forward. And then what we've also learned is that this requires the physical integrity of the supporting structures. There's a lot of input and interaction with the pelvic floor, the muscles that support these organs, and some interplay between those stimuli. So if you think about it, by the time we get somewhere between <coughs> age two and age seven, most of us have learned to kind of coordinate these things, to respond to social cues, time of day, various afferent stimuli, and so on, to make sense of it. And very subtle changes can cause these things to not work as well as we would want them to. So to, to point out some of the complexities of this, this system is, is about as simple as it gets in terms of the description. Let's see if I can make this work. Burn my eye. Um, <coughs> this basically a schematic of the innervation of the lower urinary tract. And as you can see, it really requires intact circuitry from the brain all the way to the tip of the spinal cord and everything in between. And it has much interplay, interaction, and interconnection with lots and lots of the circuits along the spinal cord. So what we need to have is cerebral function. This is primarily located in the anterior frontal gyrus, um, frontal lobe function. And this is important in terms of uh, understanding people who have difficulties with that area, post-CVA and so on. And it's interesting that some, some work, blood flow changes in the brain, uh, again, in connection with MS, various neuro, neurodegenerative processes can affect this in subtle ways. Um, this is all coordinated through the Pontine Micturition Center. It's kind of the coordinating or computer center in the brain. <coughs> Again, kind of the, the higher brain function, the middle or somewhat more primitive brain function, both being required for normal function. This is all passed through the sacral reflex arcs through S3 and S4, and this will be important a few slides down the road in terms of one of the therapeutic options, but those are basically located down towards the base of the spinal cord. <coughs> As I said before, these are mediated by the autonomic functions, the autonomic limbs of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. This is basically the relaxation, bladder contraction limb. The sympathetic side <coughs> is responsible for the relaxation <coughs> or the, the, the storage limb. This is also then wired into an afferent feedback system, something that can give us some interplay with our environment. The bladder, unfortunately, doesn't have a lot of subtlety or sophistication in its signaling or its understanding. It kind of gives us messages of, I have to go, I really have to go, and I have pain. That's about as subtle as it gets. So trying to make you know, sense of that in the context of everything else can be a little bit of a challenge. And then, as I mentioned, the importance of the pelvic floor, the musculature around the, the, the continence mechanism, the sphincter, the muscles that support the pelvis in both men and women, uh, plays a unique role in terms of keeping the neural in, uh, circuitry intact. So you can see here, too, that by the length of these circuits, the complexity of two limbs, conscious, autonomic, and so on, there's many, many places for this to derail. And it doesn't take much, and I, I'm always impressed when I see folks in the, as part of the TM Center and, and who've had that condition, how much things can be right and yet not work so well and how wrong some other systems can be and how preserved the bladder and, and elimination functions can be. And so there's lots and lots of subtle changes in terms of the patchy nature of this, this condition, the incompleteness of certain things, and the capacity and potential for recovery that really has a huge variability. Um, <coughs> so it's, a, it's really important to make sure that, that one kind of embraces the full spectrum of things, to find not so much a one size fits all, but there is a size that fits one, in a sense. So 
In voiding function, timing is everything. And the previous speaker talked or spoke of in terms of neuropathic function, this kind of inhibition and facilitation. And there's this, if I can, this is my, the extent of my animation technique right here. But <laughs> basically, and wait, it's more coming. That this runs from two ends of the extreme, which is on the, on the far end, there can be insults in this neural circuitry that lead to poor emptying or at the extreme urinary retention. The system is just off. And then on the far end, there's this kind of frequency where it's being driven, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the speedy way to, to void without our participation, without our consent, and so on. And this, at the final extreme, manifests as leakage, just spontaneous, full on, the bladder just empties without our consent. And so what we want to try and do is get back to this, you know, golden mean here or the happy medium. That's the final one, so, ooh. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> So somewhere, the, you know, there's, there's this continuum, and the bladder can kind of be pushed in, in either direction. And we see this as part of uh, a TM-MS uh, response, uh, and we need to find out which, which end of the spectrum are we, and how can we get back to the, to the, to the middle of that. And, and curiously enough, there can be situations where one has both of these conditions. And that can be, in a sense, you know, the difficulties of the double whammy. But there are strategies to try and make this system cooperate in a much more friendly way and in a way that really can ramp up or, or restore our quality of life. So <coughs> as I mentioned, I'm always impressed by the great variation in dysfunction that can happen as a result of this condition. I don't have to tell this audience that the, you know, ranges from mild to severe, absent to uh, you know, really undone. As I said, the urinary retention on one side, frequency and urgency, passing all the way towards full-on incontinence. And this can also be, in terms of incontinence, both on the basis of an overactivity or a hyperreflexia, as well as muscular weakness and exacerbating or unmasking what we call stress incontinence or exertional leakage, where that valve just isn't quite as strong as it needs to be. As you know, also the degree of bladder dysfunction or pelvic dysfunction does not always mirror the other deficits. Um, and there's, again, this spectrum of preservation of lots of other, you know, large limb function, balance, and so on, with a real discoordination of pelvic function, and vice versa. The degree of bladder dysfunction does not always mirror recovery. Um, but there is always the potential for this system, as mentioned in the previous discussion and lots of the things that you'll hear in the next few days about the plasticity of this system. There is somewhere in there the, the capacity to re-sprout, remap some of the cortical function to try and heal some of the neural tracts and so on. And I hold great hope uh, as time goes forward for trying to rewire some of these systems uh, because really what, what my role is right now is kind of to, to undo or, or get past the, the effects of this. It would be nice to be able to cure those effects, kind of go upstream in a sense, pun intended I guess. And, uh, and, and fix the circuitry rather than just kind of the manifestations of the, the impaired circuitry. And I think we'll get there. I hope it's in, in, uh, in the near future, but uh, it will come in time. And then the last thing I'd say, Kathy Kinsman's going to follow me and, and give you lots of information about bowel dysfunction, but it's one of the important things not to forget. And these two things kind of go together and uh, often share, in a sense, the, the identical insults. It's important just to highlight, again, the impact of bladder dysfunction on quality of life. And as you can see, there are many, many things that, that uh, can be affected. Certainly, there's a physical uh, issue about limitations and, and kind of uh, the, the cessation of activities or the, the concern or worry about those things. Um, there are sexual issues, as I mentioned, occupational issues about being able to, to have adequate toileting facilities, uh, the, the uh, permission for the frequency, and so on. Um, there are domestic issues in terms of leakage in that situation of, of the pads and, and expense and requirements for that. Social concerns about reduction in social interaction, the kind of uh, <coughs> withdrawal of those things. Uh, and then always, as we've seen a, a, a recurring theme in these, there's this kind of mood issues <coughs> in association with other neural uh, impact. And I don't think it's just a casual association between uh, depression and voiding dysfunction uh, and you know mu many, much of the biochemistry and the, and the uh, neuropharmacology 
share many of those transmitters in terms of normal voiding function and mood stabilization. And so there's always this kind of interplay between the chicken and the egg. Does one become more depressed because of these things or does the depression drive some of these things? And it's something that we're, we're still learning about. There are issues about self-esteem and fear of, of being burdened, lack of control, odor and so on, requirement for caregiving and so on. And so each of these areas really needs to be included in addressing these things. And, and in the majority of situations that I see, there, are, there it really is a tremendous benefit in a way to not let this process be the thing that, that drives one's life or represents the real impediment to uh, a quality and a full life. So how do we understand that? One of the, the, the big issues is first to, you have to be able to put a name on something or understand it to then try and work towards undoing it. And this is how we used to do it. Um, and we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated in the current day. But it's, it's not something that really is beyond the, the ability of, of most, I would say, in the practice of urology. Part of it, as, as Sandy mentioned, requires a certain kind of interest, enthusiasm, uh, concern for these conditions and some fascination with the process and not every urologist has that but many do and and I think there are a couple speakers before it's very very important uh, to the extent that one has these options to really find a person who is willing to collaborate or willing to take this on and and has you know the, a place in their practice or their mindset to 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 really uh, drive these things forward. And, and not everyone does, but there are many urologists in the country, uh, and it's worth requiring of, of yours uh, that that be part of, the, uh, part of the mix. So a number of screening questions. There are things that can help with a history in terms of frequency avoiding, what prompts leakage, uh, what is the experience of avoiding, what about pain, uh, nighttime uh, wetting, and so on. Physical exam in terms of trying to get a bead again on the neural neural integrity of the circumstance, primarily in the sacral region, perineum, perianal region, and so on. Urinalysis we always include because there are those things that, you know, one doesn't want to miss, mostly from an exclusionary standpoint, but there are also issues and interplay between infections, chronic cystitis. We sometimes find stones as a result of these things. And, and so there's this general, one has to remember that one's overall or general urologic health needs to be maintained while we're trying to get into the, the subtleties of, of these problems. <coughs> one of the things that's very helpful, um, and, and I, I don't know, used variably around the country, are the simple process of avoiding diary. And that is basically for a 24 or up to 72 hour period of time just writing down the experience of the toileting issues. <coughs> the date, the time, and the amount voided, some cataloging of leakage episodes if that's part of the, the, uh, the issue because it, it provides both information for the practitioners in terms of where are we starting, where are we trying to get to, and also for, for folks who <coughs> are dealing with this as a way to make those benchmarks and as a way to consciously kind of say, well, here's where I was and with, with uh, diligence and some effort and practice, maybe we can undo some of these things. And so I think it's instructive both for patients and practitioners to really guide both an understanding initially and then therapy going forward. And I think it seemed it's simple enough to do, but it really does help to use multiple senses and systems to try and get back to baseline. Because if you think going back to that original toilet training process, it isn't something that just comes out of the blue. We actually at those age have to work at it. And if you think if we injure that system later on in life, it's the same process again going back and kind of redoing that learning phase. And we know from uh, experimental work that axonal sprouting, uh, neuroplasticity, there are ways that one can drive this system uh, to, to try and get back towards a more normal function. For any of you that have played a sport or an instrument or done anything that's required a lot of repetitive action and concerted effort, we don't, it doesn't come without some effort and work. And in the background, there is a lot of neural change going on that throughout our lives we can drive. <coughs> there are a number of uh, sophisticated or more sophisticated tests that can be done uh, from simple post-void residual checks to see, well, how efficiently is the system uh, working? Sometimes this can give you useful information. I'll talk a little bit about urodynamic testing, which is really the, the kind of functional study, the real true kind of get under the hood type of test for, the bl for bladder function. And again, I'm impressed always or often by how 
little use that is in a useful way for folks with neuropathic voiding dysfunction. This is probably, for that group of people, the most important component of that, both from a safety standpoint, seeing where you are, seeing if you need to worry about anything, and then also to get some idea about what the therapeutic options are. And then cystoscopy has a limited role, I think. This is mostly, again, if there are issues about routine urologic health. There's not much that one can tell visually about the function of the system, but it often is included as a way to exclude other perhaps worrisome things. So this is uh, what a urodynamics lab looks like. Some of you may have familiarity with that. And it looks like a lot of fancy <coughs> equipment, but basically for a video urodynamics test, there's basically an x-ray unit with C-arm fluoroscopy, a computer or CPU system. There's a, a flow meter and, and a setup to measure the pressures inside the bladder. And so what this is is the catheterization of the bladder and the rectum to measure abdominal pressure and intra, intravesical or bladder pressure and to kind of put that all together during the recapitulation of the voiding cycle, the filling of the bladder and the emptying of the bladder. And what one gets, I had one more animation, the, uh, what one gets is a, <coughs> an, a myriad of data points which basically include the flow, how well the bladder empties, how quickly it can, simultaneously with a pressure measurement so that we can see, is there minimal flow? Is that the problem, the bladder weakness? Is there high flow implying some obstruction or discoordination? That information is there. There's an EMG signal, again, to see if that sphincter or the external valve, the neural control of that is intact. Is it overactive? Is it underactive? Uh, <coughs> and then measures of filling. We can understand capacity and so on. And done with that C-arm unit, one can get an actual picture of the system to understand, is there reflux in the system? Is there a diverticulum? Is there uh, funneling of the bladder neck? incapacity of that and so on. So there's really a whole range of information one can get to try and understand what's going on. And as, <coughs> as I mentioned previously, the, the need for this test or the importance of this is it really stems from the fact that the bladder is a very poor witness. We see the manifestations of some symptoms, but that doesn't always tell us what's really going on physiologically on the inside. And especially in the context of a neuropathic problem, this is really the only way one can get at the heart of the matter. So we can define the accommodation of the bladder, a so-called compliance term. How elastic is the bladder? Does it respond in that relaxation or storage phase in the way it should? If it doesn't, this is one of the problems that can actually affect or cause harm to the kidneys. Not commonly, but it's something that we need to be on the lookout for. We have an understanding of sensation during this filling process and voiding process residual volume, capacity of the bladder, whether or not there's spontaneous activity. That so-called, without my consent, the bladder just kind of takes off. We can sometimes understand that. And then also the coordination and competence of the sphincter or the valves. And then at the, at the end of the study, the voiding pressures and flow efficiency. Is there really a muscular weakness that we could help, a discoordination? Uh, and overactivity and so on. So this is really the, the heart of the matter in terms of trying to say, we have symptoms, something is going, going on, let's go back a little bit upstream and see really where the origin of that is. And so having said that, <coughs> we can move then into therapy options. And as I, I mentioned previously, from my standpoint, there, there is a, a kind of a, a box of tools, a set of concepts and so on, but they're really, and especially for this group, is not a one-size-fits-all model. It doesn't matter really about the next 20 people that come through the office. It really matters about, in this situation, what is the, the package that one can assemble and put together to, to put one's quality of life and those three goals, <coughs> preservation of kidney function, establishment of continence or adequate emptying, and the maximizing of independence and quality of life. And so, one of the dilemmas is this management versus cure strategy. We don't yet have the ability to cure in the sense of undoing the neural effects of this, but there's still a lot we can do to kind of help the body itself heal those things or make sense of them. And then in the meantime, make a management strategy that at least keeps that system functioning as normally as possible so that over the course of time, or if there are breakthroughs and discoveries, that the system is primed and ready to accept that. 
And so we really need to match the therapy with individual needs and abilities. And there's a full range of abilities based on the, the sequela of this condition that really offer a unique situation about what one person needs and what a, another person might, might need to have in terms of these, this function. And I have to say, too, that this always or often includes caregivers. As many of you know, this sometimes is a team game. And <coughs> it's very simple often to say, well, we'll just do this without an understanding of the fact of what's required to do that and who's required to do that in the context of our work day or our care situation and so on. And so the more or to the extent that one can engage those factors and put the whole team together and say, well, this is really the, the, the best of circumstances, one has to really advocate for that kind of an approach. And I just want to say briefly, I've, what I'm going to do is <coughs> the, the talk was originally kind of broken up. But in thinking about it and getting through it, the management and the strategies for these things, those principles that I just outlined, are really the same from a pediatric or an adult standpoint. We in urology have kind of separated those two fields. And, and in, in busier or bigger cities, there primarily are you know, a, a unique group of individuals who do the pediatric urology. But from a neurourology standpoint, there's tremendous amount of overlap in the pediatric and adult situation for those who have that expertise. And the, the salient features of that or the important points are that, you know, the, to, again, you know, the, the old phrase about youth is wasted on the young, but it's really not in this circumstance. And, and with youth comes a greater degree of plasticity and neuroplasticity and the ability for those systems to rewire and, and re, re-coordinate. And I think that it, it makes sense in my stand, uh, from my standpoint, in a sense, to exercise a certain degree of conservatism in that, knowing that there is this storehouse of the ability to change and a really uh, a long time horizon to try and, and manage those things in a, in a stable circumstance for as long as possible uh, until, until we know more down the road. The diagnostic and therapeutic principles, as I mentioned, are identical. There's still a role for urodynamic testing. It needs to be done in a, in a perhaps or equally thoughtful way for, a, for younger, younger folks, for boys and girls of any age, but one still can derive that same amount of information and the specificity of that information in the pediatric population. And then, of course, we need to understand in the same way as in the adult population the unique social and physical implications of avoiding dysfunction in children, how this affects school performance or social is- issues, interactions, and so on. And, and often, <coughs> if there are, is available a pediatric urology group, they often have the infrastructure su- well suited for children to make those uh, uh, efforts and, and so on. In our own institution, we have a pediatric nurse practitioner and physical therapy uh, liaison who, as a, you know, their routine circumstance are, are used to and experienced in working with children of all ages and so on. And so there is a way, again, to seek out those, those, uh, that information and those services and make use of them. And so what I'll talk about, I guess at this point I should make that disclaimer about some of the off-label things. And the same is true as for the last speaker, speaker that many of the things that I'll talk about in a sense are off-label, which doesn't mean <coughs> not acceptable, but just you know, the, the process of, of uh, doing all the, the due diligence and so on is, is uh, a, a great burden uh, for industry and so on. But all of the things that I'll speak about I believe are safe and we've been using for years and continue to use, but they're all technically not on label in terms of what's accepted. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the road is long. And I think that uh, in, in our lifetime, uh, many of these conditions will be better understood and we'll have medicines or therapies and so on uh, that will be able to undo them. <coughs> so what I'm going to do now is really break down the, the, on that spectrum with the rabbit and the turtle again. The two, when, when one kind of goes down one side or the other, and it reminds me of the old Yogi Berra quote, right? When you come to the fork in the road, take it. Um, so the, but you really end up on, on one side of that fence. And I'll reserve the, the, the real confusing group are the folks that have both of those problems. But you really tend to, f- to, to fall onto one side of the, or, or the other of that fence towards the, the poor emptying and retention side versus the hyperreflexia or the overactive side. And so what I'm just, for simplicity, going to just, you know, describe therapy for each of those aisles, so to speak. And then at the end, if there are questions about some of the subtlety where there's overlap, we can speak about that. But (coughs) 
<coughs> focusing initially on the hyperreflexia side or the overactivity, um, which ranges from urinary urgency and frequency towards urge incontinence, and we could include even stress incontinence on this side. There's a whole list of therapy therapies that have applicability and, again, some measure of success uh, in folks. The cornerstone of this, or at least initially, and this is true also for folks who don't have a neuropathic source of their, their voiding dysfunction, is behavioral modification, a very d diligent and directed effort at trying to uh, coordinate or relearn, retool some of those processes of toileting. This includes pelvic floor retraining and re-education, and this is that exercise program that we'll speak about uh, in a minute. There's a whole list of medications that now come in many, many delivery systems from oral, transdermal, intravesical, and so on, and, uh, and, and that's an expanding uh, effort uh, of inquiry and, and uh, insight in, from industry and, and also our field. There's a role for biofeedback or e-stim, magnetic stimulation, physical therapy, and there are people with expertise in pelvic floor rehab and, uh, and, and so forth. There's some measure of benefit in this. I'll speak briefly about sacral nerve stimulation or sacral neuromodulation. There's also an emerging uh, idea about denervation techniques. And the, the primarily the surgical uh, ideas of denervation have been kind of left aside. They had a, some enthusiasm years ago and perhaps more in Europe, but not so much now, primarily because of their lack of durability uh, and the, the extent of uh, what's involved. I, it never made intuitive sense to me to injure nerves or as a reconstructive surgeon, it, never it was kind of backwards in my thinking that we would cut nerves, denervate as a way to try and help. There probably is some role for that, and I don't want to be too dogmatic about that, but from a urologic standpoint, it has not been overly effective. Having said that, there is some new and emerging enthusiasm for the use of chemical denervation or biologic denervation, I suppose, with the use of Botox, and I think that Botox, you'll hear that theme uh, in many areas. It's kind of the latest and greatest and, you know, anything that can be fixed can probably be fixed with Botox these days. But there is some, some uh, emerging evidence, especially in the, in the group of folks with neuropathic voiding dysfunction, of a somewhat durable, depending upon your sp perspective, but uh, utility of, of Botox in the management of this. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that. And then finally, there's surgery. And I, I, I want to say two things. As a surgeon, I, I don't want to, again, be give the impression that, you know, surgery is where these conditions should end up or, or that's really the answer for everything. But having said that, there, there really should be, I would say, there, there is a, a definite role for that. And there is, in specific situations, after thoughtful management and lots of, of discussion and thought, these operations can be very, very helpful and they work. And done well, they can really make a difference in people's lives. And I think it's not so much kind of whether surgery has a role, it's kind of when surgery should have a role. And, and again, having been part of that culture and so on, the, the old, uh, you know, axiom is it's not hard necessarily to do surgery, it's hard to know when to do surgery. And that's the part that really, uh, as, as we discuss or, or brief, you know, briefly discuss that, that uh, that's really the place where, where one needs to kind of decide what do we get, what do we give up, and, and what's the long-term role of that. But uh, I don't want to necessarily downplay that. So going back to the, the theme here, and uh, what, what time? Am I supposed to go till noon? Do I have till noon? Okay. If you all about halfway through want to take a break, um, we can. I'm just, I plan to, to combine the two talks, and I'll just keep going. And if people look as if they need a break, we'll, you know, take a time out for a second. But anyway, the behavioral modification portion of that, and, and this is, again, it costs nothing. It's time intensive, but it's uh, easy to do, uh, although I should say it's, it's simple. It's not easy to do. It's pretty simple, but nothing simple was ever easy. And so the behavioral modification platform is really the, the kind of each spoke of this wheel, so to speak, and it involves, I think, a huge amount of education, which unfortunately the medical system doesn't really have a, a, a lot of time for nowadays. But I'm always impressed by how much or how helpful it can be simply to sit down with someone and tell them how the system's supposed to work, where it's not working, and how to try and get back to a place where it does. 
and that the capacity within us to make this system kind of to bend it back to our will cannot be underestimated. And so part of it is just going back and figuring out, well, I never really thought about it until it didn't work right. Um, and so that's the time to go back and think about it and use to marshal the effects of, of higher cortical function to, to drive this system. So that has a huge uh, role to play, I think. Pelvic floor exercise. This is a classic Kegel exercise regimen, so to speak. And that initially was, was uh, brought out by Kegel, I think, in the 50s as a therapy for stress incontinence. And it may or may not be really very suitable for that, but it does have a fantastic role in terms of trying, again, to re-coordinate the, the circuitry between the brain and pelvic function. And it's not so much about kind of the strength of those muscles or, you know, in going to the gym and lifting a lot of weights and so on. It's really about the moment-to-moment -moment control, about being able to activate and inactivate or to facilitate and inhibit that function. Because it, it, it is through those circuits that a lot of this happens in the background. And so pelvic floor exercises <coughs> can, can be useful in trying to stabilize that system again. Because there is a reflex built into the pelvis that when we activate that muscle, it tries to turn off the bladder contractility, tries to lessen that misbehavior. And with practice, a lot of practice, some people can learn to activate that muscle and turn off those problems, literally like a light switch. And so it's not everyone can get there, but it's certainly worth a try. And, and that's, w as we talk about biofeedback and e-stim and so on, it's probably in the, in the relearning or the unmasking of that, those, those functions that, that there is benefit in controlling this. Timed voiding can be helpful or delayed voiding. And this is the conscious kind of effort at stretching out that period of time before those spontaneous wetting episodes or that frequency sensation gets the better of us. <coughs> and then it's, you know, full of these little uh, analogies or, or uh, idioms, but it's the old how do you get to Carnegie Hall thing. Well, it's practice, practice, practice. And this is the reinforcement mode of that. And that's where, you know, uh, many of you have heard me say that, you know, the, the, the problem with the nervous system is it's painfully slow to heal. And if you cut yourself, you know, three days later it's healed and we don't think anything of it, off you go. But if you injure a nerve, it's months and months and months, if not years, for that to try and heal itself if it has the capacity to do so. And so part of it is having the patience to continue to exercise that and continue to drive that so that, again, the forces within us um, will try and heal those circuits to the extent that they can. They're trying every day. But that road, again, is extremely long. And hopefully folks like Doug Kerr and, and uh, you know, Miami Project and so on and stem cells if we can get them and so on will find a way to drive this process more, f more quickly and more efficiently. But in the meantime, there's a lot within us that can do that. <coughs> On the medical side, the, the medicines have a variable effect, but again, they have their role. And this really, I, I'm not going to get too in the nitty, into the nitty-gritty of this, but basically this is the muscarinic receptor family. And some of you may come across this uh, in, in discussions because this is really where industry is driving towards that kind of holy grail of where's the bladder-specific receptor or medication that will turn it off if we want to. And this is, uh, you know, there's the two families essentially, and it's really only recently Carl Eric Anderson and others were able to subtype these. But basically the M2 and the M3 are where the money is here, literally and figuratively. And uh, it's through the activation of the M3 receptor that smooth muscle contraction is driven. Uh, and then the M2 is essentially the break. The, it's the stimulation of the M2 turns off that sympathetic relaxation side, which then sets up the, the mode of contraction. So it's some of the interplay between these two things that allows us consciously to void and unfortunately even unconsciously when these things are triggered. And so the medications are designed to try and inhibit those so that we at least have a fighting chance of controlling that function. And this is just the, the kind of current list of those medications. Tolteridine, otherwise known as Detrol, and it comes in a sustained release form. Oxybutynin, which was the original one back in the 70s, still around, still effective, comes in a sustained release oral form, also has a transdermal or patch technology form. There's some work done intravesically and so on. Um, there's some stereoisomerism being looked at, some various things. Hyoskyamine or Levsin has been around for a lot. Banthine, 
Darafenison is about to be released, solufenison, trospium, others on the way. This is a huge, huge effort on the part of science, discovery, industry, and so on. And I'm optimistic, I think, in our field, both for those with neuropathic conditions and just the general public, this will be hopefully the next great horizon in urology and voiding dysfunction um, because the, th there's a huge need for it and there are uh, some, some good growing science and discovery in that direction. And so there is, you know, uh, again, as you run through the, the kind of a la carte menu, there's a role for those medications. They're not necessarily a cure, but in, con in, in the context of this thing or in a, the kind of complete package, there's a role for these medications in either modulating or uh, fixing that situation if, if it has application. Functional electrical stimulation. This is in that kind of behavioral therapy or physical therapy mode. And this is basically an office-based or home-driven therapy. The duration of the, nobody really knows the exact recipe for it, but again, it can help stimulate or trigger some of that reflex function, allow those circuits to kind of awaken, so to speak. And there are objective and subjective success rates of 6 to 80%. Not necessarily in the neuropathic group, but these are in the folks with overactive bladder disorders. And I would put even the neuropathic group in the, in the subset of, of this uh, mode. The follow-up on these studies is generally short. The durability is somewhat variable. But again, it's fairly, uh, fairly non-invasive. Uh, it's of a reasonable expense and so on. And I, I put it on the, on the list of those things that may help and won't hurt as one is kind of going through the process. Um, <clears throat> there always is a discussion about placebo effect. And I just want to say one, one thing about placebo when we're talking about this condition. And I think that, one, it's very hard to control for the, those effects that I mentioned on the first side, which is the inf influence and impact of cortical function here. This isn't... Uh, to a degree kind of an, an objective measure such as I have a gallstone or I don't. Our interaction, our enthusiasm for these both as a practitioner and patient has a critical role to play in this. And so while we say, oh, that's just a placebo effect, the placebo effect in this situation, if that's the right term, is real and it's powerful. And I, I don't think that uh, we should underestimate that. And so in putting together the package, you know, what we bring uh, as in our conscious thoughts of these things uh, is important and has a role to play. Now, I'm just going to quickly go through the sacral nerve stimulation, uh, which I think I have great enthusiasm for, primarily because it is, again, absolutely in that context of things that may help and won't hurt. This is an off-label use that I'm describing right now, but there are responders to this therapy, and when it works, it can be a home run, and when it doesn't, about the worst thing that happens is people are disappointed. So not too bad a risk-benefit ratio. This is a therapy used to treat urinary urge incontinence, significant symptoms of urgency and frequency, and even in some situations, idiopathic urinary retention. If you think back to that animation diagram, this is a therapy that in its greatest, you know, utility can push those two ends back towards the middle. It's an implantable, programmable neurostimulation system. It's not in the spinal cord, okay? It's not neurosurgery. Uh, takes two stages of therapy. One is a temporary test that lasts seven, three to seven, sometimes 10 days or longer. And then if successful, there's the implantation of a device that's essentially a pacemaker, a lead that can deliver that therapy to the pelvic nerves. This is just a couple of photos, intraoperative photos of how we access this. And this is the patient on their stomach prone. And those little sacral foramina, if you've ever seen a picture of the lower spine and pelvis, there's an opening there which below that lives the sacral or pelvic nerves which drive pelvic function. They go to the bladder, the bowel, uh, and sphincter area and so on. And it's possible to, with a little bit of practice, um, to get a, a needle down in that area and a lead that can then stimulate a nerve. It doesn't pierce the nerve, it just has to sit near enough so that it can trigger those responses. And after one accesses those, and here you can see in the sagittal view of that sacral uh, location, here's one at S2, uh, sorry, at S3, and then another one at S4, and here's the tip of the coccyx bone. And so in here is essentially the pelvis, and the spinal cord ends up here, and then those nerves on the cauda equina kind of traverse down in this little sandwich of bone here. And so if one can get those leads close enough, 
you can deliver that stimulation. This is what the device looks like. This is the pacemaker, and it's basically identical to a cardiac pacemaker. It's just put in, it's an old dog with a new trick, essentially. Um, this is what it looks like when it's implanted, and this device essentially goes up near where your back pocket or your wallet would be uh, in a nice cushioned area so that you're not leaning on it and so on. It uh, basically has no restrictions, but the only thing you can't do if you have this device is have an MRI or use diathermy, so not too much in the way of exclusions. Uh, and this is, again, the schematic, that little lead is tunneled under the skin and it dwells nearby one of those nerves. The current generation of this lead can be put in, in a, with a technique that's about as simple as putting in a central line. It used to involve something that looked a lot like a laminectomy, and now it basically has a little centimeter stab incision. And this ac access sheath can basically show you as it goes through that frame just to put it near, nearby the nerve, and here's the little stimulating locations. The lead is held in place by some tines so that it moves with the person. It doesn't need any anchorage currently. It kind of self-anchors and the migration of that is uh, almost nil. So this is what you end up with. This is during the test phase. I usually put two leads in because not all the nerves respond identically. And if it doesn't work, you basically open up these little incisions and pull the leads out. No harm done. If it does work, then you usually take one of these out and you just open up this little incision a, a bit more to put that pulse generator up in this location. So that's about as extensive, as, an, as involved as it gets. Um, at the, in the final analysis. Now this is just quick some data slides from the overall group. Certainly, and I would say as kind of uh, the caveat to this is that the folks with neuropathic voiding dysfunction, MS, uh, spinal injury, TM of, of any variability has a greater variability in success. But the way I look at it in my practice, if I test 50 people and two respond, it's made a huge difference in those two people and that's really what I'm after. So it really doesn't matter to me at the end of the day what the success rates are. I put this up only to kind of bring home the idea that this does work, and in the grand scheme of things, it has a reasonable uh, efficacy rate. This is in a, in a group of patients who did not have neuropathic voiding dysfunction, but in the general population, as many as 70 uh, Seventy-nine percent of folks had at least a greater than fifty percent improvement, and for those with incontinence, almost half had elimination of the voiding episodes. What this device does is it calms the, the system. We don't really don't know the entire mechanism, but it kind of balances that system. And I often tell my patients what it does is it allows the normal signals to get through, and it dampens down those spontaneous reflexive ones or that misbehavior, the overactivity. And if you look quickly at that group in terms of what we're really after, again, is a quality of life issue. If you look at SF36 scores, which is not disease specific, but a general measure of one's sense of well-being and so on, in many, many domains relative to the control group, which is in yellow, uh, the implant and the U.S. norms here, the implant group had significant improvement in many of these domains, looking at vitality, social functioning, uh, mental health and, and, and wellness, a sense of wellness. So this device can make a real big difference in people's lives when it works, and if it doesn't, it's something that one can check off the list and say, well, it wasn't the right thing for me. It also works for retention. I have to say in my own practice, the TM patients that I've tested with urinary retention I've not been overwhelmed by that response. I think we've had one or two people respond out of maybe 10 or 12. It tends to be a much better therapy for those with overactivity issues or hyperreflexia than the non-voiders. Um, and that's one of the things, again, I think that the, the, the nature of that lesion is different. So having said that, the denervation issues about uh, with Botox, uh, say quickly that inhibits acetylcholine re release. As you know, it kind of can paralyze the system in a durable way. Uh, it eventually is absorbed, but we've learned that injection into the bladder muscle can calm unstable contractions. <coughs> this is a technique in evolution, and generally some of the recipe is being worked out, how many units to use, what sites in the bladder, and so on. But the effects of this can last three to nine months, and this can really calm the system. So as I said before, if we're looking for something that certainly is short of irreversible surgery, this may have a role, at least for in, in some context, of buying some time. In my opinion, it's still somewhat experimental. I'm not sure it's ready for prime time, but there does not seem to be any lasting harm in the effect. It is something, obviously, that would need to be redone, and that may or may not have some appeal. The surgery issues, uh, 
again, there is a role for this. These operations work and in the right setting can really make a difference in people's lives. But I think that group is fairly small and it's not something that one would do certainly straight out of the blocks. This is just the schematic of augmentation cystoplasty and what this uses essentially is a piece of the intestine taken out of continuity, formed into a patch and sutured onto the bladder to make it two or three times its capacity. It lowers the pressures. It can and eliminate leakage. And about the only, you know, there are some potential downsides, but there is often a requirement for self-intermittent catheterization. As an alternative to that, there's also a catheterizable stoma that can be uh, constructed. This is the use of the appendix. It can be inserted into the bladder and one can create a channel on the abdomen that can facilitate catheterization rather than having to access one's own urethra, especially for women where that process can be and, and if one is in a, in a chair, can involve having to, to transfer, get undressed, find a private place, and so on. Whereas with a catheterizable stoma, it really involves just rolling down the belt line and popping a catheter in. So from a standpoint of convenience or quality of life and ease and so on, this can often be a godsend in the, in the grand scheme of things. And these surgeries in my, in, in my paradigm are not, don't, uh, involve overall a huge amount of risk. Done well, these situ situations can really uh, make a big improvement. So now quickly just the retention thing and then I would just want to say a few words about bowel dysfunction. Um, <clears throat> I, mostly I wanted to, to debunk or demythologize self-catheterization. The, the mainstay for the retention group, really the safest overall therapy is self-intermittent or clean catheterization. Whether it's desirable or not is a whole nother discussion, but this without question is the safest and most durable long-term form of management until we learn how to turn the bladder back on. Um, Foley catheters, suprapubic tube drainage has a role, but if you can avoid that, it's certainly worth avoiding. Sacral nerve stimulation has a limited role. Again, I have no hesitation of testing people, but the results haven't been overwhelming. And then surgery, again, has a limited role. I would say iliovesicostomy. This is the so-called bladder chimney. Um, continent catheterizable stomas and so on, again, have a place here as well, but in limited uh, situations. The self-catheterization myths, just for the purpose of those who, who have experience and so on, this is something that if you think about it really didn't come about until the late 70s when Jack Lapides figured out why don't we do this instead of drainage tubes and now it seems kind of almost silly that we weren't doing this for a hundred years but he was almost drummed out of the urology world for having even suggested this and now it's considered the mainstay of therapy and it really grew out a lot of experience with injured Vietnam veterans and spinal injured folks when we realized that crede voiding and straining and so on in a dyssynergic situation ultimately led to renal failure, sepsis, and, and a very, very high death rate in that group. Enter intermittent catheterization, that essentially disappeared. So um, very safe in the long run. It's okay to use the same catheter until it disintegrates, okay? There's all kinds of mythology about boiling and disinfecting and sterile and this and that. It's called clean intermittent catheterization, not sterile intermittent catheterization, and there's a reason for that. And that Again, no boiling, no sterilizing, no disinfection. There are more bacteria safely colonized in the, in the bladder of those who catheterize than there are coming out of the U.S. water system in most of our locations. Unless one is traveling to Mexico or, you know, the third world, it's safer just to rinse the catheter, pat it dry, and put it in a baggie. Um, one does not increase the risk of that. So this ought not to be a ritual that adds any time to your day. The only difference between when I go to void and, and a person who casts go to void is they bring a, a small catheter and I don't. But the process ought not to take any more time and it should not in any way be an impediment to a completely normal and full life. There's all kinds of mythology about that, but that's the science. Everything else is what my mother said or somebody said or I heard and so on. This is, and I, I, I do get a little bit dogmatic about this, but the other thing about self-catheterization is that more is better. We tend to think in our mind, well, I don't want to put that into too many times because I might get an infection. But in fact, the more you do it and the more that bladder is kept empty, the safer the system is. The pressure is low, the bacterial soup is washed away, so more is more effective. Bacterial colonization is what you have, not infection, and often there is some overgrowth and one might get some symptomatic infections in a given year, but it's generally not any more of a problem than in the average population. And 
short courses of antibiotics are effective for that, not the 10 to 14 to 23 weeks. I hear all kinds of things. Really, it's just a question of beating down the numbers. You can't eliminate those bacteria. You really need to just stabilize the situations. Once you have some neighbors, even if they're not your favorite neighbors, well, be careful what you wish for. So once that situation is stable, the self-catheterization manages it in a safe way. And as I mentioned, this is the optimal safe management. It might not be desirable, but if we're trying to buy time, this is definitely the way to go. Now, quickly finishing, the bowel dysfunction. I'll leave the, the, the real nitty-gritty to Kathy Kinsman when she comes up, but fecal incontinence and constipation are often more problematic than the voiding dysfunction, as many of you know. And the axiom that I live by is that the more empty the rectum, is a tongue twister, the better the bladder will behave. They are wired into the same place, and distension of the colon, poor motility, constipation, and so on, really sends confusing messages to the bladder and makes it difficult to sort out. It also has an anatomic obstructive function with big-time constipation, and so emptying that will often kind of, in a sense, decompress or unconfuse the bladder, so to speak, and you can often have a leveling of all the pelvic functions by, you know, by addressing both of these, these uh, processes. The problem is that most people who deal with bladder function imagine that the bowel doesn't exist, and we've done kind of a poor job at tying together pelvic function. We're trying to undo that, but it's going to take some time. Fiber, fluid, laxatives, suppositories, there's definitely a role, and Kathy will talk about that. And then I just wanted to touch briefly about the ACE procedure for difficult cases. This is called an antegrade continence enema, and it's basically a way to kind of give oneself an enema without all the rigmarole and assistance that's needed. It can be created with either the appendix or a catheter device, and I'll talk to you about the catheter device. And up to 70% of patients with an ACE can establish fecal continence on a reliable schedule. And we have some folks in the audience who, who know this to be true. It's placed surgically. I do them laparoscopically or can be put in by a radiologist. And the best thing about it is it is reversible. So if it's not the full answer, it can be undone with really no harm. This is what it looks like, and this is a temporary one. This is if a radiologist puts it in. There's a period of time for healing, but ultimately the, it look, lives in this location down in the right lower quadrant. This is what the catheter device looks like. It's a little coiled catheter, kind of like a phone cord, and it's got this little port at the top that flips open. It doesn't leak. It doesn't smell. It doesn't really provide any or, or pose any impediment. It's self-retaining and non-leaking, and it allows one to put fluid in the start of the colon and wash the entire thing out. Most enemas given kind of get up about halfway and then fall down. It's kind of like that carnival thing where you hit the with the hammer and try and ring the bell. It only usually gets up about this far, but this really is like going up to the top of the, the street and hosing the whole thing out. And so on an irrigation schedule that goes from every one, two, or every third day, evacuation within about 15 to 30 minutes, and there's a number of things that can be used, but this is the setup. So it really requires no additional assistance. Folks can sit on the commode, read a magazine, watch TV, do whatever, and be done with it and, and clean and, and worry-free until the next time. So, and I think Kathy's going to speak a little bit more about that as well. So in conclusion, I hope I haven't run on too long, but, you know, the take-home message, as you all know, the effects of TM on pelvic function are highly variable, and it's possible to diagnose voiding dysfunction and plan appropriate therapy. There are tests to do that. We've talked about that and reviewed those. The goals, again, what we need to get towards, preservation, safety of the kidneys, usually not hard to do, continence, and independence and maximizing the quality of life. Progress is incremental, but it's real, and there are ways to, again, combine and rally, marshal all, all the forces to get to that place. And as one of the other speakers had mentioned, we really have to be our own advocates. There are lots of people out there. One of the goals of the TM Center at Johns Hopkins is to kind of be that place of information transfer and, and at least kind of to, to make that horizon to, uh, known. And so uh, to the extent that we can do that, that's, uh, that's the business we're in. So I appreciate your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time, or I'll hang around a little bit, and we can do it from there. Thanks.